This time on Distant Shores, we take you aboard our Southerly 480, Distant Shores 3, on the Pacific coast of Panama, where we discover we have some problems. Means we need basically a new bank of batteries. We deal with Hurricane Iota, do a major locker cleanout, and show you our system for storing provisions. Previously on Distant Shores, Paul and I caught one of the first flights back to Panama from Toronto, Canada, after borders had been closed in Panama for over seven months. We passed our COVID-19 tests at the airport and arrived at the marina in the dark not knowing what we'd find. Then Hurricane Eta passed by, bringing stormy weather. Now that the good weather has returned, we can enjoy our sunny surroundings. La Playita Marina is located near Panama City on Ila Neos, which is connected to the Panama mainland by the Amador Causeway, which stretches two miles out into the Pacific Ocean. The causeway was created initially as a break wall to protect the canal entrance, and was built with excavated rock from the construction of the Panama Canal. It's named after the first president of Panama after independence from Colombia. It's still a break wall protecting the canal, but has also become a park and popular tourist area with bike, walking and fitness paths, a large children's playground, restaurants and shops. The Amador Causeway is a nice place to watch the ships come in and out of the Panama Canal, whose history we find fascinating. Hey, I haven't seen you for months, it seems. I've just been hanging out here on board. Has it really been that long? Seven and a half months. Listen, I was worried about the boat since she was in the water instead of hauled out like we normally leave her. But we got stuck when Panama locked down so we couldn't come back. Well, that explains it, I guess. What's a lockdown? It's when you have to stay indoors for weeks and only go out when you have to in case you get COVID-19. Well, that explains some things. The marina here has been deserted until a few weeks ago. I haven't had any news for months, but I did find this excellent book on the Panama Canal. Did you at least check the dock lines? In June, it got windy and the marina guys looked after the lines. Anyway, I've been reading this excellent book. What's COVID-19? It's a virus. There's a pandemic. Oh my gosh. Is that like an epidemic? Well, yeah, but worldwide. Is that why you're wearing that face shield buff thing? Yeah. If you're closer than six feet apart, you might catch the virus from other people. No way. Sounds like the yellow fever they have here in this excellent book I've been reading. Yellow fever? I'm not sure, but I think we got a vaccination for that before we came to Panama. Cool. Well, from this book, yellow fever was really scary back 120 years ago when they were building the canal. And of course, they didn't have a vaccine. So was it often fatal? Yeah, pretty much. Nearly 50% of the people who got it died. Oh my God, COVID's not that bad. Yes, indeedy. The French started work on the canal in the 1880s and many thousands of them died of yellow fever. Wow, that sounds awful. They built excellent hospitals and all, but they never got control of yellow fever. So people were afraid to come and work on the canal. They felt it was safer to go back to Europe or the USA where they'd be better off. With the yellow fever, people thought it might have been caused by germs and dirty conditions. I think they tried cleaning up using stuff like Clorox. Perhaps they should try that on this <laughs> pandemic. Well, there were a few people who recommended it. Then they thought it was related to too much socializing and loose living. With COVID-19, they're still keeping people physically distanced here. No parties and certainly no pool parties. In the end, it turned out yellow fever was not passed from one person to another by touching or breathing on them, but by a certain mosquito. So pools of water were the actual problem since mosquitoes were breeding there. But about this pandemic, are you sure these masks work? Well, theories vary, but they hope they do since we have to wear them whenever we can't stay six feet apart. Actually, here in Panama, they want you to wear the mask whenever you leave your residence. Yikes! Perhaps I'll stay on board. So should I wear a mask when I'm near you? We should be okay since we're in a family bubble. Can I borrow yours? No! Whatever. So the Americans took over the canal in 1903 and they knew they'd have to deal with the yellow fever problem. So they hired the top specialist who had actually sorted out a yellow fever outbreak in Cuba a few years earlier. That sounds promising. You'd think so. But when the expert got here, top canal management didn't believe his theories and didn't let him do what he needed. Panama had a number of severe yellow fever outbreaks. Actually, that sounds kind of familiar. Well, Roosevelt was president of the US and when he was brought up to speed, he made sure the experts had all the resources they needed and was very supportive. <laughs> okay, that doesn't sound so familiar. Anyway, turns out the mosquito has to bite the person within three days of the person getting the virus but then 12 days or so must pass before the mosquito can transmit the infection. That actually sounds similar to COVID too. 
How on earth did they figure that out way back in 1900? They had volunteers who offered to be bitten by infected mosquitoes. Holy smokes! Yeah, pretty brave, especially since they had a one in three chance of dying. Once they knew it wasn't transmitted from person to person directly, they concentrated the plan on eliminating the mosquito habitat and kept the yellow fever patients behind bug screens so no mozzies could get at them to transmit it. Amazing! And this was with a big team working on it? Nope, just a few doctors in Cuba with some serious dedication and a bit of luck. Are they having any luck with the vaccine for the COVID pandemic? There's a few promising vaccines being tested, but it looks like months at least until people can get it. So you're advised to wash your hands a lot and limit your close interaction with other people. Hmm, perhaps I'll stay in here for a while. Sure, good idea. tonight. Everyone's got their masks on and everyone's partying it's Saturday night in Panama City. And today the work begins. We're going to start by going through the boat locker by locker. I'm starting with the food lockers because that's where there could be disasters. I thought it would be a great opportunity to share my galley storage system and boat storage methods in general. Paul's going to be going through the boat system, so he'll show you that later. I have quite a lot of storage space in the galley with the trap. I've got a lot of drawers with all our cutlery, utensils, cooking utensils, and there's big storage under the sink here. Some things, like these appliances and baking trays, which I don't use regularly, I put in deeper storage, so there's room for the things I use most often. Pots and pans, measuring cups and bowls, toaster, spices and other condiments. Long-term supplies I store close to the galley in the lockers beneath the settees. Then it's easy to top things up. I try to label all the lockers because we have a lot of guests come and stay with us and it just helps them to find where things are and it helps me remember where I've stowed things. And I keep a very simple system of, for inventory. In each locker, I just put on a piece of paper every time I do a major shop what's in the locker and I've dated it and then and I keep a pen with the list so then when I take something out and use it so for example if I take out one of the two packages of coffee I have I just cross it off and then when I do another major shop I start with a new list but I know there's lots of great apps and some people like spreadsheets so please put in the comments below if you found a system that works great for you this um, is another thing I do, is I group like items in Ziploc bags. It just helps contain a mess if anything gets punctured or broken. And because I use every inch of uh, space that I have in my food lockers, it just makes it easier than pulling out individual packages and routing through everything. So, and I reuse these bags over and over again. In general, it's good to stow heavy items, you know, low, keep the weight low, keep the weight out of the ends of the boat, but it just makes it really easy if whoever is cooking in the galley runs out of something from those cupboards, everything's pretty accessible here. It takes a while to sort out where the best places to put things are. We've had this boat for almost three years now, and we're still moving things around and improving things as we use the boat in different ways. But it really makes living much more comfortable on a boat when you can get a bit more organized about these things. Wow, there is another hurricane forming just north of us. So I think we've got some unstable air because of that. But look at that cloud, wow.
Okay, we're going to take a closer look at this. Um, I'm wondering if really there's something wrong with these batteries. So these batteries are all in series. Series connection means the positive from one battery is connected to the negative of the next, and so on in our case for four batteries. The first battery gives us 12 volts, connecting the second gives us 24 volts, the third gives us 36, and the fourth in the series means we have a 48 volt bank. The whole system has been disconnected from charging now for a couple hours, and you need to do that in order to check the voltage. You need to disconnect it from any charging sources and any load sources, and then leave it like that for a couple of hours, and then it will settle in at the true voltages that the batteries have. So we have two batteries at 12.8 volts, 12.8, 12.89, and two batteries that are less than five volts. These two are showing two and a half and three volts, so they are completely dead. That totally sucks, means we need basically a new bank of batteries, because these all have to match as a series bank to equal 48 volts. They must all be from the same batch. We can't just replace two, so it looks like we're replacing our main bank of batteries. All right, so the battery bank in here, <laughs> it's a tight little spot. This is the place for the batteries. So here they are. There's the four 12 volt batteries. These are all run in series. So the four of them together equal 48 volts this way because you're running them in series, but they have to all work. If one of them dies, you're not gonna have 48 volts anymore and that's what's happened. So this battery has 12 volts, this has 12. This one's got about three volts and this one has one volt. This is where we're gonna put a new battery bank in. Uh, we're going to do lithium batteries this time and we're excited about that. So lithium will allow us to get double the capacity or slightly more than double the usable capacity in the same space. And because it's not lead anymore, it's a lot lighter. It's actually going to be about half the weight of what it was before. And the great thing about double the capacity here is we're going to be able to have enough power to run air conditionings and uh, run it off this battery bank. Because right now we've got about nine kilowatts of power. We're going to have 15. Uh, kilowatts altogether from the new bank, except that you can use a lot more of the 15 with lithium than you can with these lead acid batteries. We don't know exactly what happened, and uh, if anyone has any information about a really useful remote monitoring system for a boat, uh, throw that down in the comments below. I'd love to hear about uh, a really good workable system where you can find out what exactly is going on with the boat if we're ever stuck away from it for a long period of time like that. Uh, we would ideally, when we're on the boat, we can see what these batteries' voltages are, but not when we're away from the boat. So something like that went wrong. We're going to get rid of these AGM lead acid batteries and get lithium. We'll get double the capacity and uh, save almost 120 kilos of weight, cutting all the weight in half almost for that. So very excited. So in Panama, whenever you leave your residence, like this, you're supposed to wear a mask. Seems strange because there's nobody around, so it seems like it's not going to really do anything, but that's the rule. So we mostly do that. We always carry a mask, always, 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 and wear it much of the time. But on the other hand, if there's no one and you're walking on a big, long road, then I don't bother to wear the mask. Yeah, so we're going out for a Sunday lunch, which we like to do on a Sunday when everything's kind of relaxed. And Take a bit of the day off. Yeah, we've had a big week of reorganizing and cleaning and getting the boat back in order, so time to celebrate. So we have to wear the masks when we're outside, but when we get into the restaurant, once they bring you a drink and you can take the masks off. I don't think they allow indoor dining, just outdoor dining, is that right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. And one yeah. of our favorite restaurants, Mi Ranchito, is just down the road from the marina and it's all outdoor patio and it they have really great seafood. So I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Uh, throw a comment down below if you have any other thoughts. Next, coming up next time, we're going to do uh, more information on the battery change with the new lithium batteries. And we're going to do a special feature on the start of the design for the new boat. So, which we're talking about making a lot more lithium and electrical power on board there. So. Yeah. Thanks for watching, thanks for, uh, for subscribing, and see you around next time.